This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by The Nearness. Are you interested in building community with other witches and spiritual seekers? Then I'm excited to tell you about a new platform launching now, which is called The Nearness. The Nearness is offering a six-week program to help you feel more connected to yourself, the world around you, and the people you love. With workshops, expert guidance, and weekly small group gatherings, The Nearness is a perfect way to go deeper in your pursuit of magic, witchcraft, and spirituality. Signups close on January 16th, so do be sure to sign up now. You can learn more at thenearness.com. That's T-H-E-N-E-A-R-N-E-S-S dot com. And be sure to use offer code WITCH15 for 15% off. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. Happy, happy New Year, lovely ones. Yes, siree, it's 2023 and I feel curious about this year. I have some stuff planned, but I also have a lot of question marks about what this year is going to be. And that is just fine. Tarot heads are saying that this is the year of the chariot a year of big changes and movement and forward motion. And it may seem to the outsider like my year has started off with a bang because I'm currently featured in a new documentary called All of Them Witches, and it's about the history of the witch and the rise of the witchcraft movement, and you can stream it now on AMC, AMC+, and I'm told also on Amazon Prime. And international friends, before you ask, I'm so sorry, I don't know how you can watch it outside of the U.S. I will share it with you if and when I receive that information myself. But for now, I know it is available on those platforms. And I am really, really proud to be part of this film alongside so many other wonderful witches and witch wave guests who are also featured. It is such a beautifully and thoughtfully made film, so please do check it out if you are so compelled. However, do not be fooled. That documentary was filmed last summer, but currently now in the winter of 2023 as I record this, I am not feeling that sparkly external chariot energy. I am just not. I am not feeling that driving momentum. I'm not feeling super productive just yet. And I was thinking about this beautiful Lucille Clifton poem that was circulating on Instagram called, I am running into a new year. And I love this poem, but my goodness, it is so not my vibe right now. I'm not running anywhere. I'm more loping into a new year tiptoeing into a new year, napping into a new year. And I know that I'm not alone in this based upon the conversations with friends and family and followers that I've been having, but also based upon a lot of the messages that I've been reading and hearing from some of the astrologers that I follow. They've been saying that due to some retrograde energy that's happening right now, the beginning of 2023 is supposed to feel slow and that we're supposed to be super gentle with ourselves and do our very best to ease into the new year with presence, patience, and lots and lots of care for ourselves and for each other. This is what I've been calling soft magic. 
It's that magic of going slowly and accepting the natural and supernatural rhythms of our lives. And that means trusting that that chariot energy and jolts of inspiration and excitement will happen, but maybe just not yet. And it's the magic of knowing that the best way to prepare ourselves for that more fiery kinetic energy is to take the time to refill our own well right now. During the little winter break that I took from doing this podcast, I had all of these grand plans for other projects that I was finally going to focus on or begin, but let me tell you, Spirit had other plans for me. I got sick again. I pulled out my back, I had to cancel loads of plans, and all I was really capable of doing for the last couple of weeks was lying around, reading books, cooking soup, petting cats, watching birds. And it's clear to me now that this was my body's way and my spirit's way of telling me to practice what I priestess and actually fucking rest. Why is it so easy for me to remind other people of this, yet so difficult for me to enact in my own life? Why? And I would love to tell you I did this with grace and clarity, but no, I spent some of that time feeling sorry for myself and wishing the circumstances were different and feeling frustrated. But also, yes, allowing myself to enjoy the books that I was getting lost in and to savor the soup and to watch those beautiful birds flutter before my eyes. And now that my coughing and my back aches are finally lessening and I'm just getting back to my work schedule, I'm trying to remind myself of those lessons and to resist the pressure of jumping back in full force to honor my own pace right now. This means I didn't even really get around to doing any sort of extensive New Year's rituals until just a few nights ago on the full moon of January 6th, rather than forcing myself to do it on the 1st when I just didn't have the energy for it. And I say this as a reminder to all of us that we can begin again any time we wish, whether that's the new year, the new moon, or just some random Wednesday when we happen to have the time and the energy and the attention. I am so delighted to be kicking off this new year of the Witch Wave with today's guest, the artist, tarot reader, and astrologer Nanse Kawashima, because she shares some truly reassuring cosmic insights with us, as well as beautiful rituals for how to bring some soft, renewing magic into 2023. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Witches! Jessica writes, Dear Pam, After a long time at my job, I was interested in looking at new opportunities and did some spells focusing on attracting a new job. I got one. A promotion with a 30% raise. Now that I'm in the new role, I hate it and my mental health is suffering. I'm nervous now with how to use magic to facilitate change because apparently I didn't know what I wanted before. I'm desperate to get my old, good job back, but I'm now nervous about how or if to use spell work towards this goal. I'd love any thoughts that you have. Hi, Jessica. Happy, happy new year, and congratulations on going for a goal and achieving that goal. That is something to feel proud of, even if the goal isn't quite working out exactly how you hoped. But I think it's important for you to, rather than beating yourself up about this or blaming yourself, take a moment to give yourself a big pat on the back for manifesting change in your life and trying to make your dreams come true. Getting a promotion is a big accomplishment, and I'm proud of you for going for it. I would also remind you that any big change or new change can feel deeply uncomfortable at first, so there is a chance 
that you might be able to ease into this role a little bit better or make some changes to make it be more supportive and more healthy for you. But I also truly believe you that you are deeply unhappy and that this currently feels like an unhealthy situation for you. And that is so unfortunate. But I also promise that it's going to be okay. Because you have proven that you have the power to manifest change. And you have the agency and the ability to do so. So you know what? You're going to do it again. And this time, what I'd love for you to try is to do a spell that focuses on feelings, purpose, and intention rather than on the specifics of how those will be met. In other words, rather than casting a spell to get your old job back, I recommend another approach because so often spirit has much bigger and better ideas than we do about what's best for us and for the world. And you could cast that spell for the old job and hate it when you get it and be reminded of all the reasons that you wanted and needed to move out of it in the first place. Or maybe you are meant to have that job back, or perhaps you're meant to find an entirely new job, or meant to have some change happening in this current role. We just don't know. We don't know what the answers are. So what I do suggest is that you do a new spell. Yes, another spell, trusting yourself and asking for support from spirit, your guides, your ancestors, your deities, whatever names you have for that force or those forces that you feel deeply connected to in the spiritual realm. And when you're asking them for support, I would be specific, not about what your job will be, but rather about how your job will make you feel, how your job can help you thrive and best contribute your gifts to this world, okay? So let spirit know that this current situation is harming you and that you are asking spirit to help you find work that will allow you to be healthy, abundant, and to live with authenticity, purpose, and vitality and whatever other words and visions you have for yourself. And you can be as specific as you want about those value words. And if you even want to ask for specifics around things like a flexible schedule or a salary range or what have you, that's fine too. But just try not asking for a specific role or specific outcome. Let spirit surprise you. Like I said, maybe your current job can change to become more easeful or to have some unexpected benefit to you. Maybe it will be a brand new job. Maybe it will be your old job. Maybe it will be an opportunity or an epiphany that you can't even imagine right now. But I encourage you to cast this spell with love and trust and kindness toward yourself because you did not fuck up. And there's a reason that your current role is here. Yes, even as unhappy you are, I believe that there's a reason you ended up here. It was a necessary step to get you to the next one, which will hopefully be so much better and so much more supportive of you and your purpose. And hey, maybe that 30% raise is here to just help you save a little bit of money, which can help springboard you to whatever your next move is going to be. Who knows? I certainly don't. I wish I had the answers. My goodness, I would give them to you if I did. But I'm very excited to hear about how this all turns out. And I wish you and I wish you so much good luck. And please, please, please hang in there and keep me posted. Now, on to my guest. Nansei Kawashima is a Japanese artist and founder of Sibylline Vein, where she offers a variety of spiritual services. She is certified in advanced Reiki, and she has been reading tarot for clients since 2011. Her approach to tarot reading is a combination of wisdom derived from tarot archetypes and intuitive insight which is made applicable for our modern-day lives. In 2016, she started studying Western astrology as well and has been infusing that in her sessions with her clients. 
Many of the women in her maternal lineage have shared the gift of intuition, and Nanse in turn is happy to share this with her generation and growing community. Nanse's offerings include private client readings and Reiki sessions, group readings, and public events. She has done readings hosted by Tom Sachs Bodega Pop-Up Store, CFDA and Swarovski, Fortnite Institute, The Oracle Club, and many more. And as a visual artist specializing in painted collage, her work invites the viewer into a realm of subconscious stillness, yielding images that are magical, haunting, and nostalgic. She has shown her work in galleries in New York and Japan, and if you're in New York City this month, you'll be able to see her work in two shows. Nancy joined me from her home in Brooklyn via Zoom. Nancy Kawashima, welcome to the Witch Wave. Hi, Pam. So nice to be here. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to see you and speak to you. Likewise. What a beautiful way to kick off the new year. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year, yeah. So I want to start by talking about one of the first modalities that I ever knew you practiced, which is Mm -hmm. tarot. I know you do lots of other things, and we're going to talk about all of them, hopefully. Yeah, yes. But your tarot practice to me feels like such a huge part of your offering to the world. And I actually want to start by asking you about the deck that you use because it's so special and I had never seen it before. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a really rare deck, even though it's not new. It's called the New Tarot Deck by Horler and Hurley from the 1970s. And they're a set of small black and white cards And the way I came across it was really like the most magical part of the whole start of my tarot journey, actually. I wasn't actually looking to do tarot or seeking it. I did seek it when I was 10. And, Mm. you know, I got the Rider Waite Smith deck and classic, classic deck. And it's funny, I got it from a store called Middle Earth in Hawaii. (laughs) I love Um, it. It was the coolest bookstore. It doesn't exist anymore. So shout out to Middle Earth. But yeah, so that was my first deck. But because I was 10, I just couldn't navigate it. It was just too deep and complex for a 10-year-old self. Mm. Um, Mm. And I just didn't have a lot of patience. Anyway, fast forward to 2000, I think it was 2010 or 11. And, you know, I had a past career in fashion design and I had quit that job. And I wanted to start making art. And I also was starting to kind of do prop styling and sort of also curating objects with art that I made. So something I would frequently do was go to the flea market and look for objects or, you know, things that I could kind of start making things with or kind of appropriating into my own world. Like assemblage style or installation style? Yeah, kind of like that. You know, it's like sort of a curation of like found objects. It's almost kind of lifestyle, but also art, kind of sculptural, like an assemblage. So I go to the flea market with a friend who I was uh, collaborating with a lot. And we used to have a duo called Symbols and Rituals. So we're there. And usually, you know, a lot of the vendors are very organized and curated, like they have everything out and it's all laid out really nicely. Which flea market was this, Nancé? This was the one in Chelsea, New York. Okay, the Chelsea market. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that exists anymore. Maybe not. My goodness. You know, after the pandemic, I still am surprised by what has survived and what hasn't. Yeah. So that's a question mark for me, too. I hope so. Me too. It was so cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm there and, you know, there's all these vendors. There's this one vendor who didn't look like he was into it. You know, he just looked like he was just (laughs) begrudgingly there. And his stuff was like, you know, it was just a pile. It wasn't even curated or laid out. It was just like a pile of crap. And (laughs) I love it. (laughs) I know. And he just looked so grumpy. My intuition was like, you got to get in there. Like there's something in the bottom of that pile. Mm. 
you know, I was telling my friend like, hey, I really need to go check out this pile. And she was like, oh, it's such a waste of time. Like, you're not going to find anything there. Mm. And like, she was really trying to dissuade me from it. But I was like, I just really have to go. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. Like, just give me like five minutes or whatever. You were being called. I was being called and it was the pull was so strong. So I go there and I'm like digging and digging. And he's like totally like unhappy <laughs> with me, like making a mess of like his pile. Yeah. But I'm like digging and digging. And then I find this crumpled up old paper sandwich bag. Mm. And my intuition's like, this is it. And I'm just like, this is it? <laughs> mm -hmm. This paper bag? So I open it up and in this Ziploc bag, there's this like deck of cards, which is the deck that I use. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was using a lot of black and white and there's a lot of geometric shapes that I was sort of dealing with. And it was very minimal. In your artwork, you mean? Yes, in my artwork and mm -hmm. installations that I was doing. So it had such a resonance with the aesthetic language that I was already playing with. You know, I got goosebumps. I was like, wow, this is wild. Let me just say, I was not familiar with this deck until mm -hmm. I was doing research for my work mm. with you here today. And it's very striking. And because this is an auditory medium, I'd love for you to describe to people yeah. what the deck looks like. Absolutely. Um, it's black and white. It's actually very small. They're almost like the size of playing cards. Mm. And the back of the deck has the initials of the creators of the deck. And you can read it upside down and right side up. So mm. it's reflective. Mm. Even the drawings and context of the deck veers away from, you know, most of the predominantly used decks. So, for example, in my deck, pentacles is air, swords is earth. Interesting. Yeah which is not very common. And then the court cards are all zodiacal signs. So the kings are cardinal signs. The queens are fixed signs. The princes or princesses are the mutable, mutable signs mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. It's a very unusual deck. From what I've learned is that the creators of the deck were disciples more sort of like they studied under Joseph Campbell. So there's a lot of worldly or universal archetypes. Ooh, now you're talking my language. I still love Joseph Campbell. I know that people have all kinds of things to say about him now, but right. he just changed my whole world when I encountered him as a young person. So I, I love agree. hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. And there wouldn't be Star Wars if it wasn't for Joseph Campbell. <laughs> That's true. And you're speaking to a Star Wars girl. So I understand. <laughs> One of the things I love about the deck, too, is it's very graphic. It's very striking. Mm -hmm. It reminds mm -hmm. me of like woodblock prints or even Aubrey mm. Beardsley kind of oh, like yeah. that, that sort of aesthetic a little bit. Yeah. too. I mm -hmm. love Aubrey Beardsley. Such a big fan. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so here you are, you discover this treasure amongst the trash, if you will. And this deck also sort of reflects some of the iconography that you're naturally attracted to as an artist. Mm -hmm. So is this what started you down the path of studying tarot as well? Yes, this is exactly what started the tarot journey for me. So I got the deck and I was also really broke. So mm. it was also amazing that I was able to get it because I don't think the seller knew that it was a rare deck. Mm -hmm. So he was like 35. <laughs> amazing. And I was looking up this deck now sells for hundreds and hundreds of dollars yeah. on eBay and stuff. It's really, really wild. Exactly. Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to buy it if it was that price point. So that's part of why it was so magical how I got to meet the deck. And yeah, I just started sort of studying it and learning about it, you know, just for fun. I would do readings for friends and they're like, wow, you're really good at this. Like you really are so gifted in this. You should do this more. Mm. And the people that I did readings for just for fun, they started to invite me to do readings for their birthday parties or they were like can you just give me a reading and I'll pay you like a small sum and so yeah. that's 
kind of how it started. It wasn't like, I'm going to become a reader, you know, Mm -hmm. it just became more of a professional practice where my friend's art gallery wanted to do it. And then Tom Sachs bodega pop-up shop wanted me to do like a pop-up reading. Yeah. It just started spreading in that way in a very organic way. I love that though. I have to say, as you were describing encountering the deck, I had this Mm -hmm. distinct image of one of my favorite books and films, which is The NeverEnding Story. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that where like Bastion Balthazar Bucks walks into this old bookshop and then discovers this amazing (laughs) book and that sets him on this whole journey. And it's such a wonderful origin story for you, too. So magical. I love that analogy. That's awesome. So I want to know how your tarot practice and your art practice inform each other if they do at all. Because the artwork that I'm familiar with from you is also very graphic. You work often in collage. It's very beautiful and striking and elemental. Do you find yourself turning to tarot to help generate your artwork or vice versa? Or do you keep them pretty bifurcated? Mm. Well, I would say that there's definitely a connection to my practice and my art practice. I'm not someone that draws a card to make art. I know Mm. some people may do that. Mm -hmm. I find that my card, she's so old, she's like a grandma. So I try not to bother her too much unless (laughs) it's really important. Mm -hmm. Not that my art isn't important, but I think that The tarot is a tool for me in creating art in the ways that it pushes me to explore different archetypes and sort of different, I almost call it like esoteric physics where you do one thing or you take one route and then that further puts you in this other place or it pushes you into going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of cycle you know I guess sometimes it's karm it could be like karmic I think that definitely inspires me to create and explore art in that way if that Mm. makes sense Mm. you know so there's definitely an esoteric and magical aspect of my art making but most of my art making is also an intuitive hit it's like turning through pages where I see like printed ephemera and then I just immediately get a hit of like, oh, this is what I'm going to do with this image, or this is how I'm going to paint over things or collage it. Mm. So I totally see the connection because tarot is so intuitive and you're kind of fluidly discerning messages from these images that turn Mm -hmm. up. Whereas making collage, you're also kind of going through this stream of images and then... yeah taking messages or at least reacting to a calling from those images to be part of your final artwork. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How fabulous. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Rosarium Blends is an esoteric herbal apothecary and occult bookstore specializing in materia magica, and it is one of my favorites. They make their own ritual incense, which I often use myself during my rituals. They also make enchanting oil blends, talismanic natural perfumes, planetary sigil incense, cleansing sprays, grimoire inks, erotic apothecary blends, alchemical cosmetics, and so much more. Most of their formulations are original recipes and result from extensive historical research, practical experimentation, and extensive magical studies and training. Each of Rosarium's formulas is blended and charged during the appropriate lunar phases and astrological correspondences to enhance their potency and increase the heightened awareness they were designed to awaken. With a special aim to elevate and enliven the senses, each formula is a living spirit serving as a direct link to the inherent energies its charm embodies. 
And best of all, Rosarium Blends is offering Witch Wave listeners an exclusive promo code for 15% off your entire order, though please note that that excludes sale items, rare books, and some limited items. That promo code for 15% off is WitchWave15, and you can use it at rosariumblends.com. That's R-O-S as in sorcery, A-R-I-U-M, blends.com. The Witch Wave is sponsored by BetterHelp. When do you feel like your best self? I know I do when I've taken care of my physical needs through things like sleep and eating well, and my spiritual needs through making magic and connecting with kindred witchy souls like you. And I also feel like my best self when I'm addressing my emotional needs, and a huge part of taking care of those has come to me through therapy. I've been in therapy for the majority of my adult life, and it has allowed me to address the feelings and circumstances that sometimes bog me down, overwhelm me, and keep me from being that best version of myself. I've found that when I'm addressing my emotions with the help of a great therapist, I'm able to better live my purpose, be more empowered, and ride the waves of change that inevitably come for all of us. Therapy has helped me develop coping skills for stress and anxiety, thereby helping me be able to do what I came here to do and be the fully actualized witch and human that I'm meant to be. Now let's be clear, I'm still very much a work in progress and always will be, but I truly don't think that I would have the courage to be writing my books or doing this podcast or teaching workshops or what have you without having had a lot of therapy to support me and help me work through my own emotional struggles. I truly, truly wish that Everybody could go to therapy because I believe that it can benefit all people if they are open to it. And you don't just have to have some heart-wrenching drama or trauma that you're facing down. You can also go just because you need a neutral, safe space where you can be heard and focus on your own needs and feelings. If you're at all curious about therapy, BetterHelp is a great option because it is more convenient and more accessible than a lot of other offerings out there. It's affordable and it's entirely online, so you can communicate with your BetterHelp therapist from virtually anywhere. All you have to do to get started is fill out a brief questionnaire online to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge because BetterHelp wants you to find the right match. So if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Go on and visit BetterHelp.com slash WitchWave today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash WitchWave. Take care of yourself and live the life you're meant to. Hi, Witch Wavers. I have exciting news. At long last, we have some new Witch Wave merch available for you now through TeePublic. We decided to go with TeePublic for our new Witchwave merch because it is a print-on-demand site, which means you can get different variations of the Witchwave logo printed on t-shirts, mugs, totes, stickers, magnets, notebooks, oh my gods, the sky's the limit. And the shirts come in different styles and fabrics and colors and are available in sizes small through 5XL, so you can order whatever you'll feel you're most magical in. So head on over to witchwavepodcast.com slash shop. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Nansei Kawashima. So Nansei, we were talking about intuition and how you use mm -hmm. intuition in your tarot practice, you use it in your art practice, you used it to find your first tarot deck that you still use. And I'm curious how you think about intuition. Is this something that you feel you have a connection to through your family? Do you have a metaphysical understanding or a magical understanding of intuition? What does that word mean for you? Mm, good question. Well, 
So my grandmother on my maternal lineage was very intuitive. She was also doing divination. She did a type of astrology that was more based on Chinese astrology, but not like the ones with the animals. It's sort of like the planets have different elements kind of affiliated to it, similar to like Western or Vedic astrology, but it's not the same system at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's something she practiced. She also practiced I Ching and she was someone that was very connected. Like she could meet somebody and then sense their energy or, you know, she could sense different spirits. And she also had a lot of little rituals that she would do that were based on esoteric Buddhism and just things that have been passed down to her from her lineage, her ancestors. I think her mother was also a very intuitive psychic person too. Mm. So it skipped my mother, but it came to me. And it's something that I've always sort of had, even as a child. And I think as a child, it was really difficult to navigate because you're not sure like what's real and what's not real. And I guess the best way to describe it is what's in the third dimension and what's not in the third dimension, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what's not tangible, like physically. I think for me, it was something that also used to get me into a lot of trouble as a kid because I would hear things or see things or feel things. And then I had this strong urge to alert others, mm. you know, but then sometimes it wasn't something that adults wanted to hear or like it wasn't appropriate for someone to hear. Right, right. I imagine it could be really surprising or shocking or alarming yeah. depending on what kind of message you're telling them as a young person. Yeah. And you know, when you're young, you don't have all the tools yet, like the kind of verbal tools yeah. that adults practice. Right. To deliver something maybe a little more mm -hmm. sensitively or delicately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think part of being an adult, you start to learn like, what is a good time to say something? How do you say it? Like, how do you deliver it? Mm -hmm. That was something that I've always had with me. And I think most people have that as a mm -hmm. child, you know, and I think over time through conditioning, and maybe like part of it is what I experienced where it's, oh, you're doing something bad or like what you're doing right now is not, not okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe it starts to shut off a bit or like they lose that connection. And I definitely went through a period of my life when I wasn't as tuned into that. I want to ask, do you remember mm -hmm. what that period was? Because I have a theory and I want to see if I'm right. Do you remember when you yeah. sort of drifted away from it and then when you I found do. your way back? Yes. So I studied fashion and accessories. So I worked for seven years or so mm -hmm. as a fashion designer mm. and a handbag designer in New York. And, you know, I had a very jet setter, glamorous life, but it was very material. So how old were you? I was like early 20s until my Saturn return. Yep. There you go. It was so similar for me. And similar. Really? it's very similar to a lot of people that I talk to on this show and just wow. in my life that those of us who are attracted to, we'll just broadly call it a magical perspective, it kind of gets a little often, not always tamped down once we're young adults. For me, it happened a little bit in college too. Wow. And then navigating the world as an adult and you're trying to sort of fit into these systems and be taken seriously, right? And yes. get ahead in these systems. And then for me, in my mid-20s, I started circling back to this and being like, wait a second. Not that I ever stopped loving magic, but I was more intellectualizing it. And then right. I circled back to it and I was like, no, that really worked and it meant something to me. And it's not just about an intellectual exercise. Wow, I love that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not surprised to hear that you circled back to it, I guess, in your late 20s, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Nancy, I didn't realize this. You and I have known each other for a little while now. 
But I didn't realize that you moved like all over the world Mm -hmm. as a young person. Can you talk a little bit about where you lived and how that kind of fluidity might have affected your artistic practice and your healing practice? Yeah. So I'm Japanese. Both my parents are Japanese, but they met in El Salvador in the late 70s. Mm. So I was born in Japan, but we did move back to El Salvador for a little bit. And actually, that's where my name comes from. It's the name of a tree in El Salvador. Ah, beautiful. Thank you. So I lived in El Salvador during the war. And we had to quickly evacuate shortly after because it got too dangerous. But because my father was in the coffee industry, he was hired by a Japanese coffee company. And then we were quickly kind of sent to Jamaica. So we lived there for seven years. Then we moved to Hawaii. And I was also sent to a boarding school during middle school because they deemed I was like turning into a bad kid. A bad seed. (laughs) a bad seed. Um, <laughs> so I went to boarding school for a couple years in Japan and then I came back for high school in Hawaii. Yeah. And then I decided to study design in Japan, in Tokyo. So I went back to Tokyo. I studied design and I quickly realized that as a woman, we, there's not a lot of like equality there in mm. terms of like workplace or even society. I mean, Mm. I think it's getting better now, but it's also very hierarchical. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of like, you know, kind of age hierarchy. And I had a green card. So I was like, I don't know if I want to work here. I think I'm going to go back to the States. So I've always been really drawn to New York. I decided to continue my education here. I really had no plans of being here for this long. But I think that because of my kind of diverse background. It just feels like home to me because it's like a melting pot of people from all over the world. Yeah. New York is the best. Sorry, listeners, if you live somewhere else, (laughs) I'm sure you feel that way about your home. But I am as in love with New York City now in my 40s as I was Mm. when I was a late teenager when I first moved here to go to college. I just it's the best. It really is. How it influences my artwork was your question. And your intuitive practices oh, and yeah. offerings. I think that collage in itself is very much a great mirror reflection of my upbringing because my whole life has been like a collage. You know, I've had to move around so much. And from every place that I lived in, I took aspects of it that I liked culturally, aesthetically, and then I took it along with me on the journey of wherever I was going. And I think Mm. it's the same with healing. You know, I feel like there are parts of Jamaican magic or, you know, kind of like esoteric elements that I really was influenced by or inspired by. There's also a lot of like spirituality in Hawaii, Mm. you know, with the volcano goddess Pele and, you know, how people interact with the land there is so immensely magical and beautiful. There's such a connection, you know, and respect to Mother Nature there. Yes. And also even my Japanese heritage, like all the things that I've learned through my grandmother or living there with the healing and the aesthetics and going to art school there was really a big deal for me too. I think it really has a huge impact on who I am and what I make today because I did have to move around a lot. I never really connected or belonged to one particular culture or Mm. place, Mm. you know? So I had to make my own home within my own inner landscape. You know, I had to kind of create my own rituals. And I think that's part of why this deck came to me because this deck doesn't really follow a particular lineage of tarot. And it's sort of its own weird little thing. And I feel I'm also my own little weird little thing. Like I'm not (laughs) here nor there. And I think my chart is heavily ruled by Mercury. So I Mm. really, really resonate with Mercury in a lot of ways where I'm like constantly borrowing and kind of collecting things and making it my own, but also sharing that with the world. Yes. And traversing boundaries too. Yes. Traversing boundaries. Yes. Ah, Love that. (laughs) Love that. So in addition to your tarot and your art, you also, I know, do Reiki. You Mm -hmm. are an astrologer as well. 
you were saying to me earlier that you are getting much more deeper into your Ayurvedic practice too. Can you talk a little bit about when someone comes to you and they know they need some kind of guidance or some kind of healing, how do you know which modality to work in for them since you do Mm. so many different things? Yeah, well, I would say first and foremost, I'm a tarot reader, tarot practitioner. That is my main tool of healing that I use. Mm. You know, I love doing Reiki and astrology is something that I kind of had to start learning because of my tarot, because all the court cards had all these zodiacal signs. Yes. So it kind of forced me into it, you know? Yes. So I could further my practice in tarot and it started to become something that I just take really great interest in. But with healing, I usually have the clients decide just looking at my website and seeing what draws them. I think that's really the best way. Like it's really whatever is calling to them. But I do infuse other elements into whatever session I'm doing with them. So for example, if I'm doing Reiki and there's an imbalance then I will suggest an Ayurvedic thing, like an Ayurvedic regimen or Mm -hmm. routine or like an herb or something. Yeah, and I think with tarot, sometimes the Ayurveda and astrology definitely plays in, you know, where it's like, oh, well, let's look at your transits and like see what's going on here. Yes. (laughs) I feel like the readings are always very intuitive. There are certain things that I'll sense or there's like a ping that I get and I'll be like, what's going on in this part of your body? Like maybe this is something you want to deal with, Mm. you know, and maybe that's not something that they brought up with me, but it's just something that came up and they're like, oh my God, how did you know? You know? Yes, yes, yes. So I think I just kind of use my tools freely and kind of mix it up intuitively i guess that's the key word here yeah i love it on that note we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back the path 365 daily direction for ladies and mothers witches and others is a book that allows you to open your mind body and spirit to a path that is uniquely yours As a gateway spirituality guide, it weaves coping mechanisms identified in neuroscience and mental health that address mind, body, and spirit, and incorporates them into an easy-to-read daily guide. Author Susie Newell received her doctorate from the University of Cincinnati with a focus on coping mechanisms. This book gently encourages people to open their mind to a spiritual path that feels right for them. Like a daily oracle read for the soul, The Path 365 takes you through a journey of positive self-discovery and encourages you to incorporate your practice into every aspect of your being. Whether you have a solid spiritual practice already or are exploring your options, The Path 365 is a unique guide to creating a path of your own. Visit them at the path 365.com for ordering options and be sure to use code witchwave for free shipping and you can give the path 365 a follow on your favorite social media platform we are all in this thing together create a path that works for you would you like even more witchwave do you wish you could hear from me and my other bewitching guests on a weekly basis then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards for some tiers also include magical merch and contests where you can win witchly prizes each month, as well as early heads up about my workshops before they sell out. And all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly online rituals and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witch wave witches around the world. So head on over to patreon.com slash witch wave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. 
Thank you so much. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Nansei Kawashima. So Nansei, you are my first guest of 2023. And Yay. as far as I'm concerned, it is still the new year. And so mm-hmm. I would love to hear a little bit about any kind of messages or practices that you feel called to share with me and our listeners today regarding how to approach this sparkling new year. I think 2023, we're starting it with Mars is finishing its retrograde and then it goes direct in January 12th. It doesn't change signs until March 25th. So it's still going to be in Gemini for a while. Okay. What does that mean exactly? Well, I think, you know, depending on where it's hitting everyone's chart, I would say it's like a lot about collecting. You know, Gemini is always like seeking and like collecting things. And the collecting magpie like, of the yeah. zodiac. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like bits and pieces of like information. But sometimes it's also like, I think, gets sort of distracted. <laughs> Ooh, I'm a Gemini rising. I know all about this life. You know, it's like, ooh, I'm, I was collecting this or I was super interested in this and studying this. But this other thing like, <laughs> is super interesting. So I'm going to go over here. Yes. Ah, oh, too real. Yeah. I mean, I have Mars in Gemini and Venus in Gemini in my midheaven, which, you know, explains why I'm just kind of all over the place, too. <laughs> eclectic. Let's put a positive spin on it. There we go. Very eclectic. Hey, I'm proud of my Mars and Gemini. So nice. No shame there. <laughs> <laughs> because it is retrograde, though, I would say it's almost like you're taking inventory of like, wait, so that thing that I collected, do I still need to keep studying this or looking into this? Like, where do I need to purge or edit? Mm. There's a lot of revisiting of things. I think anything that's retrograde, like anything that's re, you Mm -hmm. know, revisiting, reviewing all the re things. Yes. And I think Mars is about taking action. So it's about, you know, revisiting your actions or, you know, maybe it's less about taking action, you know, more about being more contemplative. Yes. Reflective. Reflective. There we go. Exactly. And then I think We start the new year with uh, Mercury is also retrograding. It retrograded on December 29th. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be retrograde till January 18th. Again, re, right? There's a lot of revisiting, reflecting. and Revising. Revising. It's also a time of the ghosts coming to visit us, whether it's your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend or maybe your ex-boss. You know, people from the past reconnecting with you. Which could be a good thing. Let's let's be yeah. clear. I think that Mercury retrograde often gets a bad rap, but sometimes it can be a real gift. Yes. Thank you for saying that. I feel like there's so many treasures that come out of going through retrogrades. I think retrogrades are also great because what happens is that it shakes up the norm, like your daily norm. Mm -hmm. So it makes you have to like be more flexible or shift the way you're thinking, Mm. you know, because we're so, especially New Yorkers, I feel, or people that live in cities, you know, we get so set on like, well, I'm supposed to get there at this time and it's supposed to get done at this time. Yes. What's next? What's next? Yeah. And then you get so frustrated when it doesn't go as planned. But I think the beauty of retrograde is you have to work around things being kind of unexpectedly delayed, you know? And I think like what I love is like when you have to work within that, you have to learn to become more spontaneous. Mm. And that spontaneity also ignites this sort of creativity, you know? Yes, yes. And the spirit of surrender. And that's a lesson I keep having to learn over and over again, because I like to think of myself as like a master manifester, a make shit happener. But sometimes, let's be honest, usually shit is out of our control and being able to roll with that and surrender and welcome the gifts that come through surprise is something that I'm trying to embrace more for this year and beyond. I love that. It's so true. It's really, really challenges us to surrender. 
Yes. Oh, so getting back to the beginning of how the year starts, we're starting the year with some retrograde energy, Mm -hmm. obviously, with Mars and Mercury. You know, I think that for people that do resolutions, like maybe don't set anything in stone yet because... You know, you're basically starting a resolution during a retrograde. So it might go very slow going or it might not go as planned. Mm -hmm. So I would just kind of like hold it lightly. And, you know, maybe by the time it retrogrades over and it's out of the shadows, you might be like, I don't know if I really want that resolution anymore. Yes. I'm not a resolutioner myself. I have my own New Year's ritual, which I'll share with you guys later. But yeah, yeah. To me, resolutions seem very stressful. <laughs> like, I have to do these things, you mm. know? And it's like, why do I have to do it again? Yeah. You know, it just seems punishing or something. <laughs> yes, yes. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Although I came up with a New Year's resolution already. It's so basic. I'm going to just call it basic witch (laughs) in the spirit of the show. Yeah. That it made me like laugh. It's like just so dumb, but I really need it. And so my New Year's resolution is, (laughs) I feel embarrassed even saying it, but it's to have more fun. And it's so basic. It's so basic, but I need it. Like, I'm like, I just need more play. I need to laugh. I need to not take shit so seriously. I really need to welcome the spirit of just like pleasure and fun this year. That is my goal for 2023. So good. So not too punishing, I don't think. No, (laughs) I think that's great. I love it. Well, let's talk about some of these rituals that you might want to bring into the conversation. Something I was very intrigued by when you and I were first talking Mm -hmm. is this calligraphy practice that you have. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So every New Year, I do this New Year ritual that's called kakizome, and it literally translates to first writing. Mm. And the reason why it's called first writing is because traditionally, you would use the first water that you draw from the well Mm. to kind of prepare your calligraphy ink with. Traditionally, people write a character or a poem, whatever it is that is kind of inspiring for that year. You know, before the pandemic, I used to host these like parties where people would come over and then they can like write a poem or like a phrase that they want to kind of be sort of reminded of throughout the year. Mm. I think it's also really great for manifesting because you're with other people putting that into paper, right? And then you're talking about it, you're sharing it with others. Part of manifestation is also about sharing it with others in some way. Mm. Just so I understand, Mm -hmm. this is not writing a resolution per se. This is more some kind of like, is it an intention, would you say? Or what what are some, I don't know, examples? Yeah, yeah. Good question. So for some people, it's very specific. You know, it's like, I want to get a car. (laughs) Sure. You know, or maybe like you, it's like, this year I want to have fun. So for me, I always make it an intention that I want to set. Like, what's the general theme of my year that I want to explore? Like one year I wrote grace. What does it mean to be graceful? You know, and Mm. then what always happens, I feel, is that there's always challenges and rewards that circle around that word grace. You know, it's like, how do you hold grace during something very challenging, you know, and through that, you really learn to hold grace. Mm. 2022 was interesting because I got COVID. I couldn't really do kakizomi the way that I normally do. Like normally I would kind of reflect on it and think about like what the intention is or the, you know, the concept or the word that I would choose. But because I was so sick, like I just had no capacity to do that. Mm. So It was the first time that I actually relied on my tarot and I pulled all the majors out and then I picked a card and I got judgment. So, you know, it was the year of judgment for me, which was really interesting because it really was my year to sort of the firebird, like rising from the ash kind of moment for me. Yes, yes. Judgment is ruled by Pluto, right? So anything Plutonian and like scorpionic, (laughs) I would say... All those things I really got to delve into and kind of connect with the shadow and 
work around that, which was super empowering. Yeah. And I think that is something that's cool because it's not just like one aspect of my life, you know, or it's not like a material thing that I'm just like buying or achieving. Mm -hmm. It's something that could be applied to all aspects of my life. Like Mm. it could be my friend circle or how I communicate with myself or, you know, what belief system is old and no longer serving me and needs like an up leveling. Yes, yes. I love this idea. So for listeners who might want to do their version of this magical New Year calligraphy practice or tarot practice, how should people start? Can you walk us through it a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So traditionally, we use calligraphy paper and like a Japanese calligraphy pen and ink. But Mm -hmm. I think that it could be whatever it is that you're called to. It could be, you know, watercolor or acrylic paint. That's really up to your discretion. I would light a candle. Sometimes I use a selenite to kind of like hold my paper down. Mm, So it's also like practical, but kind of magical. I love selenite. Yeah, for listeners who might not know what that is, that's this beautiful, I don't know if it's considered like a gemstone or a mica. It's some. Yeah. It's in that family. Mm-hmm. The ones that I usually see, they often do come in wands, but they can be all different shapes. True. And it's not like quartz. How would you describe it? It looks very lunar and... Yeah, it's more opaque than a quartz. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. It has a sheen to it, like it's shimmery, Yes, I would say. Like, it's not clear. I have one right here. Yes, it's so beautiful. And the way the light hits it is so, yeah, there's just this sense of mystery and mysticism. It's one of my favorites. Totally. So I use that, and then, you know, I light a candle. And then sometimes I make it a whole ritual, like I'll take like a bath, I'm all about the bath. Me too, my friend. See, this is another yeah. reason why I'm so attracted to you. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm a bath witch for sure. Baths are amazing. So yeah, sometimes I'll do a bath and then I'll kind of reflect on like what I'm letting go from the last year. And then like I just picture everything like draining down into the drain and saying goodbye to it, releasing it, you know, mm. maybe I'll meditate first. And then sort of like see what comes up for me. And sometimes I think that's enough where you're like, oh, I got this ping. So I'm going to like write this word. Or you could draw a card like I did last year. If you're like, I have no idea Mm -hmm. what it is, Mm -hmm. you know, and then maybe you can pick a word or some kind of element in the card that resonates with you. Like maybe there's someone or something in the card that you're like, ooh, this is the thing that I really want to focus on. And then sometimes you don't even have to write the word, like say judgment necessarily. Like for me, my word was ascending or flying. Yes, yes, yes. you're kind of like ascending and flying, meaning like you're expanding and going beyond part of the world that you haven't been able to. Leveling up kind of? Yeah, leveling up. And then another aspect that I do is For my phone passcode, I make the phone passcode the word that I picked for the year. Oh, my goodness. I love that so much. Yeah. So you're reminded daily. Oh, yeah. This is my theme this year. So you were typing in the word judgment every day or was it the word flying? Well, maybe you don't want to tell us. It's okay okay, because I'm going to change it. (laughs) Oh, right. Okay. So you were typing in ascend all through Mm -hmm. 2022. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I have not heard of using your like passcode as a magic spell. And of course it could be. How fabulous. Oh, that's so inspiring. So that's one thing you could do. And then in some parts of Japan, they burn the scroll on the 15th. Mm. And they burn it during a festival called the Sagicho Festival. And Some say it started because of a warlord, Nobunaga, in the 1500s. And some say it was also to celebrate the warlord's death and the burning of his castle. It's kind of unclear. But for me, I always pick the full moon of that month. Mm. So the full moon of January. Mm -hmm. So I burn that and then I just try to like picture the ashes being kind of picked up by the universe. And the universe is like, you know, going to take care of that for me. 
How beautiful. And just because I know we have some very specifically minded listeners, Mm -hmm. after you write the word, you then roll it into a scroll and then you burn the scroll. Or I suppose people can do whatever they feel called to do, but I'd love to know what you suggest. Yeah, they can do whatever they want with it. I like to put it in front of somewhere that I'll see it every day Mm -hmm. until I burn it. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, sometimes I look at it and then like kind of think about it and journal about what else does this word mean to me? Like how else does it manifest in the world or what colors is it associated with? Some people could also make an altar around that, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes with my Ayurvedic studies, I like to identify which energy center it's sort of affiliated with or also picking either role models or deities or goddesses or gods that might also assist with you on that journey, Mm. you know, like angels. Or I also think that's a huge part of the creative process of this ritual is like you can really make it anything you want. Yes. Sometimes it's also a great way to use that as a tool for like writing or creating art. I just adore this. I am going to do it myself this year. Nice. And I'm so excited. I hope other listeners will give this a try too. It's so, so beautiful and it's really resonating with me. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Nancy, I know that people are going to want to work with you. I know they're going to want to see your artwork and learn more about everything you do. So what is the best way for people to connect with you? Well, I'm on Instagram at Nancy Kawashima. My healing practice, I do have an Instagram account, but I'm not very active on it. But it's Sibylline Vane. Ooh, I love that. Thank you. But most of my activity is on Instagram, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I do have an art show coming up on January 19th at Chashama, New York City, and also at Gunstrom in Brooklyn. So all of that will also be posted on my Instagram soon. And yeah. Fabulous. Well, I can't wait to see the new work that you have generated. I personally would love to connect with you for some healing practices because I just have so much respect for what you do. And I so... Likewise. Thank you. I feel so inspired by the way that you infuse your artistry and your magic and allow them to sort of cross-pollinate so fluidly. It just really rings my bells in all the best ways. So... Well, thank you. Likewise. I can't thank you enough. I wish you and I wish you a very happy and abundant and fun and creative 2023. You too. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being on the Witch Wave. Happy New Year. Happy New Year and Happy New Year to everyone. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Nansei Kawashima for helping kick off the new year with bewitching beauty. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you and you just might make it on the witch wire. The Witch Wave is a phantasmophile production written and produced by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was recorded and edited by Josh Wilcox and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Our new Witch Wave logo was designed by Thunderwing. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Lara Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now buy Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and give us lots and lots of sparkly stars. It really, truly makes a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchWavePod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider ordering my book, Witchcraft, and or picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which are both available everywhere now. And if you want more WitchWave or you would just like to support the show, 
please join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.